Hi guys. So the next characteristic property we want to learn about is the state change points. So this would include melting point and freezing point, boiling point and condensation point, or sometimes it's referred to as dew point. So this graph shows you, using the kinetic theory, what happens as you heat a substance, right? As you add energy, this is what you'll see. Along the bottom, energy is being increased, so we can measure energy any way we want to, maybe in joules. Um, and as we add energy to our molecules, the temperature of the molecules starts out going up. So whatever we're, we're heating gains temperature. And that's true as long as the substance is not changing state. So let's say we started with a solid. Let's make it ice. That ice, the molecules were vibrating in place during the leg of the journey where I colored it red. Then they hit this temperature where they have just enough energy that they can begin to rearrange themselves from the solid state to the liquid state. Now you have to realize that this process of rearranging the molecules so that they're a little further apart and have more freedom of motion, that's going to take energy. And we say that molecules have a choice to make when they reach a certain temperature. Either they're going to use the energy they're being given to speed up, or they're going to use the energy they've been given to spread apart and become more free in their motion. A state change point is the temperature at which a substance magically is at that exact point where it has enough energy to overcome the attractions between the particles and change from one state to another. That's a unique temperature for most substances. So for water, this change between vibrating in place and rotating around each other, that change happens at zero degrees Celsius. So this temperature right here would be zero degrees Celsius. I know that looks like three circles kind of, but it's supposed to be zero degrees Celsius. Now, if we don't continue to add energy, if we just leave the room at exactly zero degrees Celsius, what you would see is really nothing unless you had a time-lapse camera because over time what would happen is your ice cube would slowly seem to be changing shape on you. But it would be happening so slowly that with the naked eye you really wouldn't notice it. But after a couple of hours you'd begin to say to yourself, gee, wasn't that ice cube a little more um, solid looking before? Wasn't it more squarish and now it's kind of like circular or rounded? That will happen over time because what will happen if you keep the room at exactly that temperature, zero degrees Celsius, the water will go back and forth, back and forth between solid and liquid. So one molecule might break away for a second and turn to a liquid, and then it'll go right back to being a solid. But in the time that it was a liquid, it might move a little, changing the shape of your ice cube. But that's going to be happening at the microscopic level, and you're not going to really notice it. However, it's pretty rare that we keep a room at exactly the right temperature for water to melt or freeze at. And notice I said melt or freeze. Look at A and B here. A and B, these arrows, show that melting and freezing both happen at the same temperature. At zero degrees Celsius, a substance is at its melting slash freezing point. A lot of students find this very confusing, that freezing and melting can happen at the same temperature. But they're really the same process. It's the process of a molecule or two being in the, in the exact temperature range where it can almost but not quite break completely away from its neighbors. And so it'll go back and forth. It'll just bounce back and forth between being a solid and being a liquid because it's almost but not quite right there. So those molecules will sort of be jittering around and then being a liquid for a second and then jittering around and being a liquid for a second, back and forth, back and forth. If, however, we continue to add energy, they'll just melt. If we continue to take energy away, they'll completely solidify. So melting and freezing both happen for water at zero degrees Celsius. Now other substances melt slash freeze at other temperatures. Remember the lab where we heated lauric acid? Here's some lauric acid. It's a waxy white substance when it's in the solid stage. And what we did was we just heated it in a test tube inside of a water bath so that it turned to a clear liquid. And then I let it cool back off. Usually I would come around and put it in a cold water bath so it would happen quickly and it would turn right back to a solid. So what is the melting slash freezing temperature of lauric acid? 
Well, it's 54 degrees Celsius, which is warmer than this room is right now, considerably warmer. You would need an alcohol burner to get up to that temperature. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, so it's halfway or so to boiling water, right? So you might not realize it, but every substance has its own unique melting slash freezing point. And you want to get used to using the term melting slash freezing or freezing slash melting to help remind yourself that these two processes happen at the same temperature, which is really confusing for a lot of people. But you just have to convince yourself that they're the reverse of each other and they happen at exactly the same energy point when the molecules have just enough energy that they're sort of right between solid and liquid. That's melting or freezing depending whether or not your energy is increasing or decreasing. We have another one of these points between liquid and gas. For water, if I continue to heat the water up after it's a liquid, it'll now start to boil and we call this the boiling point. Going the other way, if my water is a gas and it's say floating around near my shower because it got nice and hot near the top of my shower, it's floating around my bathroom and then it wanders into a cold area near the mirror, it'll turn back to a liquid and that's called condensing. So that's the condensation or dew point. Again, they'll both happen at the same temperature. On the Celsius scale for water, this temperature where water can either turn to a gas or a liquid is 100 degrees Celsius. So at 100 degrees Celsius, while your water is boiling, if you keep it at exactly 100 degrees Celsius and you don't add any more energy, the water will boil and then recondense and then boil and then recondense. You don't usually notice this though because you usually heat your water on an, uh, in an open container. But if you've ever heated something on the stove with a lid, you know that it keeps going through this process of turning to a liquid when it hits the lid. So you can maintain, if you maintain the same temperature for a long period of time, your water will boil and recondense and boil and recondense. Okay, so in the lab, when you want to know what temperature something melts or freezes, or boils or condenses at, what we do is we actually go and heat it and look for a flat portion in a graph. This flat portion here is a period of time where the temperature stays the same during the changeover from one state to another. You usually want to use a temperature probe for this rather than a regular thermometer because my temperature probes are very, very accurate and I can show you how to use those when we actually start doing lab work with this. Those flat portions on the graph are called plateaus, just like in geography, in world cultures, you may have come across plateaus. They're flattened out mountains. A plateau on a graph represents a period where the temperature is the same. And usually on the bottom here, instead of measuring the amount of energy, we just measure the amount of time that we've been heating it. So as time goes by on the bottom, the temperature will go up for a while, then it will plateau for a while. And during that plateau, you'll see a state change. That plateau temperature is the temperature at which your substance melts, or if it's boiling, the temperature at which it boils. And that can be useful information. You can use this to identify different liquids, for example. If I gave you water and alcohol, you could see which was which, even though you could probably smell the difference, but you could tell which one was which by boiling them, because at the temperature at which the boiling plateau occurs would be your boiling point. It's tempting for students to just say, oh, well, I can see when it starts to boil, Mrs. Stracuzzi. It starts to bubble. But believe it or not, a liquid will start to bubble way before it's actually boiling because it'll start to evaporate and, and some molecules within it will start to leave sooner than others. So you always want to wait till you get to your actual plateau before you decide that you have a changeover. That's it. I'll see you guys in class.